Hello. It's kind of uncharacteristic of me to start a day with a meal, but today's one of those days. I was up pretty late working at the studio. I came home. I had to do a bunch of uh, technical stuff for this very show, and and I actually only got a few hours of sleep. So uh, we got a lot to do today, and I I'm going to need the energy. Times like these remind me uh, how important it is to always have something in your kitchen that uh, you really like to eat and doesn't really take any amount of work. For me, that's frozen gyoza, a Chinese pork dumpling made in a Japanese style. And I've got a really hot pan, I'm just going to drop these in real fast. Pre-made, uh, they're not that expensive, maybe three or four dollars for a package, uh, and you can buy the wrappers and make them yourself and freeze them yourself. Just throw them in a hot pan, put about two ounces of water in it, and um, cover it. And it's okay if the lid is sort of touching them, they've just got to steam. While they're steaming, I got out my sauces. We have soy sauce, mirin, which is like a sweetened sake, and sake, cooking sake, really. It's got salt in it, so you can sell it in a grocery store. And, and you can find uh, these two things, mirin and sake, at most Asian grocery stores or Japanese specialty stores. But let's be real, um, just order them on the internet. Unless you have a sweet Japanese grocery store to go to. So I got a really hot pan, and I'm going to add a little bit of sake. And the same amount of mirin. And we're just going to let uh, whatever alcohol is there cook away. Um, they say once you boil, like wine or spirits, the alcohol goes away, but actually that's completely wrong. So if for whatever reason you want to be absolutely sure there's no alcohol in it, like if you're sensitive to it uh, or you're recovering, you'll have to do something else. And that is, use the nose. The nose knows. If it just goes straight down and doesn't give you that warm feeling. And we want to reduce this a little bit. The mirroring will help the sake thicken into more of a glaze, which is exactly what we want. And I uh, realized that I look terrible right now. I didn't sleep well and uh, haven't really taken a shower yet or gotten ready, but reality, reality is uh, the worst. And I have a reality show. So once the glaze thickens, we're gonna add some soy sauce. Uh, about the same as we added of each of the other two ingredients. And then just incorporate that, mix it. You can see it's already getting thick. And right about the same time, uh, our gyoza are probably done. Just use your fingers, check, nice and brown, turn off the heat. You can see we have a nice thick sauce here, and we'll just glaze. And I like to top it with a little katsuobushi, which is uh, dried skipjack smoked. Throw on a little black sesame seeds, uh, you know, for no reason. Done. It's really important to like the food that you eat. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it has to be good. Mm. Maybe I will um, do more Japanese cooking in other episodes, uh, but in the meantime, if you just work on that sauce, you'll be surprised uh, at just how delicious it is. It's also really important to have around the house clothes that you really like. Super comfy. I love this sweater. Carhartt. It's only been a few minutes. I'm already getting roasted on Twitter. Claire's wondering if I burnt the soy sauce. Nope. You gotta add that soy sauce at the very end and then turn off the heat. Claire's right though, uh, it's really easy to burn soy sauce, um, and if you do, it tastes like burnt toast, 
So make sure you take it off the heat. It's actually really hard to do a Snapchat while you're cooking because uh, you only have one hand. Um, but I will cover more recipes. Well, a meal and a shower uh, is exactly what I needed to get enough energy for the day. Now I'm going to head to the office. Better hit the road. I haven't been um, studying Japanese cooking for very long, just about three months. Um, in a former life, I uh, worked in a fine dining restaurant for a while, and that's when I first learned uh, like how to make dashi, some of the uh, simmering techniques and grilling techniques, and uh, some sauces like and ingredients like yuzu. But it actually wasn't until about four years ago when I was living in St. Paul and went to this like ramen and Japanese breakfast place called Tampopo that I really understood like just how coherent the cuisine is. And every so often I spend a few months of hobby time here and there studying a cuisine. And since about Thanksgiving time, um, I've been like really trying to understand the basics. And if you grew up with Japanese food or really know what you're doing, you know Japanese cuisine is about basics. And from December of 2015, uh, I've really been deep diving into it and trying to like really make it happen. And that's barely enough time to really know anything. Uh, certainly not enough time to know what you're talking about. I found it really hard to find uh, like recipes or techniques described without this little like I'm an American chef trying to learn Japanese food here's my take which I'm not even kidding is about like 90% of the cookbooks so if you're uh, interested in learning more about it um, there's a few good places to start in my opinion by far the most helpful one for me was like this borderline uh, Japanophile show made in Japan for the UK audience called Begin Japanology of all problematic things uh, by this guy Peter Barakon. And it's kind of like a reading rainbow-esque show, but the episodes about food, uh, you know, they'll spend 45 minutes looking into like izakaya culture or bento culture or uh, abalone or soy sauce. But ends up being a pretty good resource if you want uh, to just study one ingredient or one technique or whatever. Um, the other one I would say is Japan Eats, which is a podcast uh, put out by the Heritage Radio. But if you didn't grow up eating and cooking Japanese food, um, there's like an obvious dynamic that uh, people in America and Europe uh, often jump into, which is to treat the cuisine or any other aspect of a culture um, as a product of others that can somehow be easily mastered uh, simply by respecting its difference. Goddamn, if that isn't how it all goes down every fucking time. Because here's the thing about like a kind of white expertise. You can only be an expert, whatever that is, uh, in something that would otherwise be foreign to you. And mastering the foreign, well, that's, uh, that's colonialism. As a kind of ambiguously ethnic, multiracial black person in this country, I am foreign to everything that I see which means I've got no interest in mastering what's foreign to someone else or what's foreign to me. But learning new forms of alienation actually give me great satisfaction and relief from all the old ones. Rendering that uh, fine line between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation is knowing when that relief comes at someone else's expense. Knowing that is harder than just about anything when you do most of your learning and socializing on the internet, which is why people are so fucked up over there.
which is why it's so important to be a good sport when someone roasts you. Keep moving, Claire. Roast me. So, time to pick up where we left off. Before I make another mess, I'm gonna quick check in with the editors of Mask Magazine to see if there's anything they're blocking on that I can help move forward. Cause say it with me, keep moving. Yesterday I organized our uh, book and magazine collection full of theory, art, fashion, rare anarchist periodical, and converted our cabinets into a stacking system. And today I'm gonna pack those up and get everything. And while I do that, why don't you think about your own workspace, whether or not you like it, whether you find it easy to make priority judgments in, and most importantly, whether there's stuff laying everywhere that you're constantly worried about but never acting on. Put that stuff away. I like cleaning because I find stuff I didn't even know I had, like this commemorative AK Press 25 year anniversary beer koozie. Koozie, cozy, quick pull. Okay, so it's been about 25 minutes, and I'm gonna let you in on a little organizational tip. So if it's been a while since you've uh, organized your workspace, you'll notice that there's like, you know, things where they're not supposed to be piles all over the place. Leave those there. Instead of just putting them into cabinets or trying to sort of like sort them into places as you put them away, just group them together in a place visible. Table height is best because that uh, reduces the amount of kneeling and bending that you do. Good on your knees, helps you stay moving. And you wanna kind of survey all of the stuff that you have. All of the stuff that didn't really have a home in the first place. And then you think about, um, you know, how would you group those things together in a way that would help you find them when you're looking. Clean out all of the cabinets that you have uh, that are unorganized, put things into those piles as well. Look at those piles and think about some nouns to use. Maybe notebooks, uh, charging cables, um, cameras, art supplies, whatever. And then write those nouns onto some post-it notes. Then you take those post-it notes and put them on all the empty cabinets and drawers and shelves in your workspace in the way that makes the most sense now I already emptied all of these cabinets. I haven't moved a thing into them. I haven't even set the height of the shelves. And that gives me an opportunity to sort of observe. Using this method, I can put things away deliberately and sort of review the organizational structure as I see everything that has to be organized. And remember to leave a few areas unlabeled for things that might come up as you're packing up. And because I've done this, this table does not look like an overwhelming mess of shit. All I have to do is put each thing uh, where it goes. Easy. And all that only takes about 30 minutes, which means I can do that whenever the office gets a little chaotic. I wonder if I'll be able to make, like, exhausted dark circles under your eyes uh, fashionable with this show. Let's see him. Very important to be relentless. This is garbage. Now or later. So I'm just gonna save myself the time and throw it away now. But you also find some gems. Gotta save this one. I hold here in my hand Hannah's critical theory honors thesis, which I'm contractually prohibited from showing you but inspired mass. One time Foursquare uh, sent me a bunch of swag for I guess like being an influencer or something, uh, which is kind of hilarious because here I am doing it. Too bad you can't spend a plastic frisbee, am I right? Two very cool books. Magazines. Here's another organizational tip. If you're like me, or uh, most people probably, uh, You'll probably have a bunch of loose papers that don't really go anywhere. They don't even belong to a file or a folder. And if they just have like one little bit of uh, important information on them, just take a picture with your phone and throw it in the recycling. And for those loose pieces of paper that like aren't important in any sort of, uh, you know, logistical way, uh, but you still want to save for emotional reasons, put a few of your favorites aside 
and uh, just hang them up and get rid of the rest of them. Uh, I love this trick. Merlin taught me. Here's an early design study I did with uh, photos stolen from The Great Discontent, uh, which is a great magazine. You should totally check it out. The last type study we did for the Mask Magazine logo. Can you guess which one we picked? Printer jammed two and a half years ago, and I've had it on the wall ever since. And it's my screensaver. And if you're not going to put it in a file cabinet, and you're not going to scan it, and you're not going to put it on the wall, you're going to put it in the recycling. Sometimes I just can't resist a good brag. Jump over to DJ Khaled's Snapchat and watch him go to the underwear store and buy Kelvin Klein's major. It's not that I'm psychic, it's just the world is so predictable. I've just got a few more things to um, sort through on my desk, and other than that, I am done. I want to show you two more things and tell you two more things. The first is this composing stick, which I used to use when I ran a letterpress studio for hand setting blocks of text. I keep it around to remind me that so many radicals and anarchists in history were also typesetters. And spreading ideas around the world on the internet when so many have done it one letter at a time is something I never want to take for granted. The other is this line gauge, which printers used to use to measure the physical distance between one shape and another, among many other things. I keep it around because I never want to forget that even though the internet seems immaterial, it is manufactured and produced. Two things I want to say is firstly, if you want to watch reruns of this show, you can go to samehandle.tv, which will take you to YouTube, and you can watch the old. And secondly, I set up a Twitter account to make announcements and, you know, that sort of thing, and that's at samehandle on Twitter. I got it. Credits. Hannah, Isabel, and Anju, all the contributing writers at Mask Magazine, our subscribers, special thank you to Claire and Merlin Mann.